Welcome to our instruction course. I'm Dr. Meenakshi Swaminathan. I'm from Shankaranetralia, Chennai. And I have with me a wonderful team. And we are going to help you uh, know the ins and outs of what to do after your residency. This is going to be a very informal IC. Please feel free to stop us, ask questions. We are here to help you and guide you. How many of you here are in the middle of your residency, your PG? Pretty much everybody. OK. We hope we can be of help to all of you. Um, without much ado, we're going to uh, start with Dr. Rashmin Gandhi. He's managing director of Beyond Group, consultant, center for sight, and former senior consultant, Shankar Netralia. Most importantly, a very, very good friend. And uh, I invite him to talk about solo group corporate institution practice. It's practice for you. Thank you, Dr. Minakshi. It's always a pleasure to be part of uh, your instruction course. And thank you for inviting me. So actually, for this presentation, I have only two slides. And one slide is already here. And the reason why I put all, all the titles is because just to highlight as to why I am giving this talk is because I was in an institution for 18 years. I do uh, work with a corporate group that is Center for Sight. And I'm also running my own uh, company where we are doing various work. So maybe I'll be able to give you the perspective from all three angles. But the fact of the matter is that there is no truth. There is no universal truth. Uh, what works for me may not work for you. What works for you may not work for me. So I am going to keep this very, very interactive. And maybe ask uh, any of you is finishing the residency or the fellowship training in next one or two months? How many of you are, are finishing the training, whatever the training may be, in next two or three months? Right. So uh, feel free to answer. As I said, it's very informal. Do you know what what you're going to do after this? You, c you can shout out the answer. Yes. What what are you going to do? Corporate. You're going to. Uh, Work in a corporate? Residency training program, yeah. So about the fellowship, we would have a talk a little later. This is somebody who has finished everything and now entering the big world of uh, working, right? So uh, any of you is, is going to enter after fellowship or residency? If not, then we'll just keep it saying. How many of you would, if you are, imagine that you are finishing your training, that is residency and fellowship, and now you're going to enter the real world, so as to say. So how many of you would enter an institution? How many of you would like to join an institution? All right. So may I ask you, why would you join an institution? What are your expectations from an institution? And what do you think it will give you? All right, so when I, when I say corporate uh, and an institution, when I say institution is more like a teaching institution which has a research and academics as part of it, like L.V. Prasada Institute, Narayan Netralaya, or Shankar Netralaya, right? So you would like to, uh, be, you are joining an institution because you know how it works, right? Why would you like to join an institution? Right. Somebody from here who said that they will join an institution? Yes. From joining an institution, you get to. Uh, hello? Sir, I think uh, joining an institution will help in academics also, being in touch with the students and getting to know all the new things coming up. And uh, getting the senior support is also an mandatory. Uh, so. Right. Anybody else has any ideas? I mean, even if you're not wanting to join an institution, why would you not join an institution? Or, I mean, what do you think an institution would give you? So the, uh, the overall consensus is that if you join an institution, you, have, you are part of the team. You have a support from uh, experts in that particular field, whatever you are interested in. And you, uh, the platform is there for academics and research. 
do you think institution would have any pitfalls? There can be some negatives which are you aware of or <clears throat> Yeah, what do you think? I mean, when you join in, I'm sure no platform is perfect, right? So what do you think may go wrong if you join an institution immediately, a little later, down the line? Anybody can answer. I'm, I'm just asking these people because they volunteered. But anybody, I mean, would say that, no, I would not join an institution because I know these are the pitfalls. And we can not feel free because this is, as I said, before, this is not really a theory or uh, sort of a knowledge transfer. This is more like a discussion because there is no universal answer. Yeah, go ahead. Why would you not join an institution? See, there is nobody, no institution boss here, so don't worry. It's not that your career is getting affected. Yeah, feel free. Uh, Akshay, why would you not join an institution? If if you if I were to answer, I'd say uh, it doesn't pay as much as private practice. So I don't know if that's on your minds, but I would say low pay is one of the biggest fears of joining a institute. And please remember, it is coming from Dr. Akshay, who was DNB at Shankar Netralaya, and then he did his VR fellowship from LV Prasad Eye Institute, and then he was in uh, in New York for his oncology fellowship. Uh, so he has been at the best of the institutions, and he is he's nice enough to say that, well, it doesn't pay. So that can be one of the factors. Devendra, uh, why you have not joined, I mean, of course, you are part of institution, but why you didn't join back uh, Shankar Netralaya or Elif Prasad? So there are, I mean, there are more than one reason does spring to mind, but uh, in private practice, you do have a lot of independence. Now, whether that is a good thing for you or a bad thing for you right at the beginning of your career is debatable, but in an institution, you will always be bound by the hierarchy of the institution. You'll always have someone to report to. You'll always have in, a, in the vitreo retinal department of Shankar Netralaya, 20 VR surgeons above you. So there is a lot of you know, um, uh, hierarchy in such a system. So probably if, if you are someone who's very uh, independent minded, you may not fit into something like that. So now you know that institution gives you a platform for academics and research. It gives you a team support. It gives you, you have seniors. The very fact that he said 22 people. So we have 21 people to look up to in our retina department if you are learning. But that also can become the negative because, you know, beyond a point in time, you, need, you are bound, bounded by the mold, bounded by the vision. Now, if your vision uh, actually coincides with the vision of the institution, then it's great for you. There is also a, a feeling uh, that beyond a point in time, there is a possibility that you might hit what is known as a glass ceiling in an institution, where after that, uh, the growth becomes very slow and it can become very painful. So these are the reasons why, I mean, these are the things that you have to keep in mind if you're looking at uh, an institutional work. Now let's look at a corporate hospital. Now when I say corporate hospital, I mean uh, places like Center for Sight, Vassan Eye Care, wherever it's existent, Agarwal's uh, Center, and uh, these kind of centers. Do you, any of you have an exposure to a corporate setting? Uh, yeah. So are you, are you enjoying working there? Corporate world. What? So, wh what would you say would be an advantage working in a corporate setting? Not taking names, but any corporate setting. What do you think? What do you find it advantageous? Um, I think it's uh, it's got a very good work culture. Mm -hmm. uh, you have very specific timing, and uh, it's quite methodical. I feel the way it runs. The corporate world, yeah. yeah. The corporate world. Uh, any one of you would be a little shy of joining a corporate world and maybe the reason here? Would you, I mean, given a choice, I will say that, okay, all doors are open. Would somebody consciously avoid the pathway which goes to a corporate hospital and the reason? Yeah. So there is always uh, a little tag right, a perceived or a real tag attached to a corporate world, saying that corporate is all about money, right? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, corporate exists because they, they do good work, but they have to earn money. That's, that's all corporates would have that goal. Now, how much of that goal affects you is what, I mean, would determine whether would you choose a corporate or not. There are corporates where they don't bother you with, uh, 
any pressure of operating or advising investigations or even with the timing. While there are corporates which, uh, I mean, uh, apparently would ask you why you didn't operate, why you didn't advise OCT, why you didn't advise FFA, a non-technical person might be sitting on your head asking you that uh, why you didn't do it because our targets are not met. So corporate which are purely target driven, where, earn, as Akshay mentioned, earning money is not a bad thing. But earning a bad money is, is not really a good thing. So if you're earning money a good way and within the ethics that you have put for yourself, it's not a bad thing. And second thing, even if corporate is, is indulging in a practice which is not affecting you directly, then you may say that, yeah, fine, it is not affecting my day-to-day -day life, my conscience, or my ethical uh, framework. Then corporate is a good way to go. What about a solo practice? How many of you would, provided that you are comfortable with your training, you are confident with what you are going to offer to your patients, uh, would you jump into solo practice? What would be the advantage? What would be the disadvantage? Would any of you jump into a, a solo practice? No. Why? Yeah, okay. Why would you not go for a solo practice at this point? Provided that you are confident with uh, what you want to offer to your patient. No, I mean, just assume that you are now fine with your training. Uh, you know what you want to do, you, you are fine with your subject. Would you now think of entering a solo practice? It, in, it involves a lot of infrastructure. Initial investment because it's all your baby, yes. Waiting period, you have to wait out for two, three, four, five years before you are as busy as you were in your MS or DNB or, or not, absolutely. So solo practice, three main things. Initial investment, you are on your own. So there is no such thing as, okay, I'm going to attend AIOC in Jaipur and then take two days break and go around Janta Mantra and all. No, that may not happen in solo practice, at least initially, for the first four, five, six, seven years. After that, maybe it will allow you the, the, the independence you would get in a solo practice, but it comes a little later, especially in today's day and world where the corporates are starting their branches all over. So you are competing with people who have deep pockets. So you need to compete with deep pockets. So in summary, I've just made a, a chart, pie chart. So this is all right. This is no, no philosophy. There is no spiritualism. This is a materialistic world. And a basic goal, uh, what one look for after one is through with the training, is one works for prestige with, in the bracket, power, money, uh, pleasure, job satisfaction, which uh, institution would provide in abundance. And since I couldn't uh, think of anything which start with P, I have just invented a spelling, independence. You are not dependent. Uh, there, is, there is always a, a sort of a, uh, a feeling that in a solo practice, I am my boss. I don't want to answer anybody. Remember, that is, there is a relative independence. There is a difference between not being answerable and not being accountable. You are always accountable, either to your boss in an institution, to a group of people in a, in a corporate, or to your patients and to community at large in solo practice. And you need to determine as to wh what, which dependence you want to choose later on in your life. And I'm sure all of you will succeed. Again, thank you very much, Dr. Minakshi. Thank you. Thank you, Rashman. And any of you who think of questions um, in the middle, feel free to interrupt any of us and uh, ask your clarifications. Next, I invite um, my former DMD student, uh, again a very good friend, Dr. Akshay Nair. He went on to do um, an ocular oncology plastic surgery facial aesthetics fellowship at the LV Prasad, and now works as a consultant at the Advanced Eye Hospital Institute, Navi Mumbai, and also at Aditya Chot Eye Hospital and the Lokmanya Tilak Municipal Medical College and Hospital. I invite him to tell, talk to you a little bit about the ICO fellowships and exams, because if you think, okay, now I have finished my DNB and MS, can I get a little bit of exposure in another bigger center? 
maybe a big center in India, maybe a big center abroad, uh, that will just really round off my um, exposure in national, during the DNB or the MS, and it will give me add to the CV for sure, and may improve my networking. Uh, why not? So, ICO fellowships and exams uh, fill that gap. And over to Akshay. Thank you so much, Dr. Minakshi. Uh, since there are so many of us residents here, how many of you all have actually taken any one part or two or all three parts of the ICO exam? About maybe 15 percent. And how many are planning to do that? Okay, so this is a good target audience to then let you know about what the exam is. So this is just an overview because at, at, at mo it happened during my residency that my seniors were saying, ICO exam, ICO exam, ICO exam. I said, oh, okay, ICO exam, ICO exam, without realizing what it was. And before you knew it, I had spent a lakh and a half and I had given all the exams. Then I was wondering, what do I do with this ICO certificate? So then, uh, of course, this is a good platform for me to let you know what exactly is the ICO and what comes out of it. So in this talk, we'll be talking about what is FICO, what, what the why of it, and uh, what is the point of having to appear for these exams, and what do we gain Actually from all of it. A little bit of theory and background and things about how uh, the ICO is, a, 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 is an organization which actually is aimed at uh, being the group that brings all professional associations of ophthalmologists together. It's, uh, the office is based in, in London, the examination office. The headquarters are in San Francisco. Uh, the International Fellowship Office is in Munich, and you pay your fees in Swiss francs. So I don't know what it is, but it's, some <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, they say their mo mission is to enhance ophthalmic education and improve access to the highest quality of eye care in order to preserve, restore, and enhance vision. I think if I go on more about things like this, I might end up seeing this in the hall. So I'm going to stick to what really matters, the exam. So there are three main exams. The first is a foundation assessment exam, which we don't need to bother about. The foundation is, is, is something that is free if you register for the basic sciences. It's, it's basically a tool for preparation for the basic sciences. So you take an exam to prepare for the basic sciences. It's, it, uh, we, if you enrolled into a residency program, I would strongly advise you can directly give the basic sciences exam, which is a two hour exam that you can initially appear for. Uh, most residents, uh, usually take this up in their second year of residency or towards the end of their first year when they actually realize that, oh, this is ophthalmology. This <laughs> is 80 MCQs with four options and one correct answer. It's not too difficult. The difficult part, of course, is the subjects involved because there is a lot of neuroanatomy, neuroembryology, uh, development of the eye and things of those <laughs> sort that we tend to have forgotten. Pathology, genetics, and epidemiology and statistics also come in to torture you in that exam. Uh, the most important part of this exam is that along with it, you have the theoretical optics and refractions. And this is a separate paper that is usually clumped along with med the basic sciences. Now the thing is, this is 40 MCQs with four options and again one correct answer. These are a, few, a little more analytical where you have to calculate. Now you need to clear both of them independently. Uh, it's not that if you get say 10 out of 40 here, you've got 60 out of 80 here or a similar mark percentage, you end up pass, passing the, the basic sciences and refraction. You need to pass each of these independently and only then do you get your certificate that says basic sciences and uh, theoretical optics and refraction. So a lot of them, of course, a lot of candidates don't end up clearing either one at which uh, the next time they can appear for the second, ex the second part uh, individually. Once you're done with this, in towards the uh, after, after your residency gets over and probably before you get into fellowship, is when you have the clinical sciences exam. I think this requires three years of uh, three years of exposure in ophthalmology, which usually uh, you know amounts to your residency program before you're eligible for this uh, exam. It's a four-hour uh, exam, which is 200 MCQs uh, with four options. Again, a relatively simpler op uh, question uh, exam because if you've just uh, appeared for your final exam in your theory, you're fresh with that theoretical knowledge and you know, simple revision of your standard ophthalmology textbooks usually see you through this exam. 
because uh, there the, the, the examination is largely similar pattern to what your residency program is. Finally, then is the advanced uh, exams, the advanced course of the ICU, which is a three-hour uh, examination where there is an extending matching type plus 75 con contextual description answer. So here, you have to choose your answer depending on your level of certainty in that option. When you have a question, there may be two or three options which you might have to choose, and your the degree of certainty is with with which you feel strongly about a particular answer has to be marked. So there will be negative marking. Of course, the, the core of ophthalmology remains the same. And once you've passed this exam, you get another fancy certificate. Now let's come down to the economics of it. Now th these are 2015 costs that I'm putting up. So this is the Swiss franc rate has not changed much since then. So if you see, the total amount that you actually end up paying is quite a bit and this can be enough to shock anybody. So how do you prepare for these exams? I think there's going to be a little overlap with Devendra and uh, myself on this. Uh, I'm going to talk primarily only for the, the basic sciences. The optics and refraction, I think everybody prefers to follow the standard textbooks of uh, Elkington. And uh, if you're used to the DC version, that is Professor Khurana's optics and refraction, that's a good handbook to go through as well. Uh, I have no, what I've seen is that our institutes and uh, corporate hospital residents uh, have a big disadvantage uh, in optics and refraction when it comes to our government hospital, municipal hospital uh, colleagues who are used to refraction uh, on a large scale. So they're much better at this. MCQs in the ISO exam uh, seem to be picked, picked out verbatim. The lines, the options don't even change when, as they are picked out of John Ferris's book. So that Fer John Ferris's book serves as a good uh, uh, guideline to read for the, with the aim of passing the examination alone. Uh, for the clinical sciences, ka uh, ka your Kansky would be a good, good uh, book to read. Now what is the benefit of g appearing for this exam? It basically just makes sure that you know you're going to read the entire uh, syllabus. It essentially provides a nice structure to what you're doing. So in your first year, you actually read about the theory of optics and refraction and basic sciences. Uh, just before your fellowships, you're done with your uh, clinical sciences. But what are the, not disadvantages, but you know, uh, are the ad other advantages of this would be initially, of course, you are, you are eligible to appear for an ICO fellowship abroad. Now this fellowship doesn't, uh, is something that I'll, I'll go through uh, in detail about how you apply for it. Also, if you do plan to appear for the FRCS Glasgow, you are exempted from the early steps if you've cleared uh, the basics and the clinical sciences. You ca and if you've cleared all three parts of the exam as or having taken the ICO fellowship to go abroad, you can add FICO to your name. Uh, better job possibilities, uh, is, uh, is something that's not very sure that because I don't know of any particular region, country or medical council that actually prefers or gives a higher pay scale to doctors who are FICO cleared. But I do know of, of like say for example in the Middle East and Gulf, doctors who clear the FRCS exams get a higher pay grade compared to those who haven't. So it doesn't actually allow you to practice anywhere. It's not a degree that you know allows you to go to the UK and operate and there is also a possibility that you are able to take the FICO or, or you know, take, receive the FICO fellowship to go abroad without having to take these examinations. And at the end of the day, they are expensive. So it's a balance between what, what is realistically what you want and what it's really worth. Now to talk about the ICO fellowships, there are different types of fellowships. There are three month fellowships and there is a one year fellowship. Uh, so the ICO recommends that you need to have taken one or more ICO examinations uh, before appearing, before applying for the ICO fellowship. Uh, although we, I do know of candidates who have actually gotten a fellowship without having appeared for the examination. Uh, given the number of people who are taking the exams these days, it is unlikely that that would continue. And I think as of now, in order to receive an ICO fellowship, you must have cleared the exams. So the three month fellowships are primarily aimed at us in the developing countries. They give you a fund of 6,000 US dollars which are transferred to your account before you leave. 
So you can even change your mind at the last moment and keep the money. Uh, they have two annual deadlines, one is in the March and one is in March and one is in September. And there are a set of prerequisites that I'll come to later. They also have a ICO Retina Research <coughs> excuse me, Foundation, the Helmrich Fellowship, which is a $33,000 grant, which covers your one year of expenses, living expenses. Uh, apart from the guidelines of age and your country of origin, this uh, fellowship is not one where the ICO looks for a, uh, a host institute, matches you with them, and then facilitates the fellowship. In this case, you should have applied for the fellowship on your own, received the grant for the fellowship, and then go to the ICO and say, hey, I have a fellowship. You want to give me some money? Then they see your credentials and actually say, yeah, you know what? You're a good candidate. Here's $33,000. They also have a similar uh, Fred Hollows Foundation one year subspeciality. Here again, uh, they give you a $24,000 grant for a, a one year of living expenses. But of course, there's a, 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 a condition here that you should be from a teaching institute or a public service hospital, and also you should be, <coughs> you should have, you, you should be giving them a guarantee that once after this fellowship is over, you come back and join back in the teaching hospital or the public service hospital. Also, you have to again in this case you have to seek and obtain your fellowship on your own, and this is just a funding uh, fellowship. There is a SARC fellowship, but uh, I don't I don't dwell much on this because I'm sure none of us would. There are the, the better opportunities in India as compared to uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. More importantly, what when do you apply for this fellowship? I'm just going to take a couple of minutes more than my allotted time. Uh, before fellowship in India or after your fellowship in India, I strongly recommend that this an ICO fellowship for a three-month course duration be taken after you have completed a clinical fellowship in India. Because when you go abroad, there is very little hands-on that you get. What you actually learn is more in terms of how do you, uh, soft skills of how do you speak to patients, how do you manage complications, how do you uh, learn and observe and imbibe finer aspects of practice, finer aspects of surgery, things that you see for the first time and say, okay, this is a new technique. But if you haven't done your fellowship, you won't, A, you won't appreciate that that's a new technique, and B, you won't be able to reproduce that. Whereas, uh, say, if you've done your plastics fellowship, you're comfortable with process surgery, and you see someone using a new sling material or a new uh, way to pass the sling around, and say, hey, I can reproduce that. And then you go back and incorporate that in your practice. So these are things that will come to you only after having done a fellowship here. Is it worth it? Is it? It's worth it if you know what you're looking for and what you're getting into. If you're looking to actually add quality to your practice, then uh, it, it might actually add value to it. But if you're looking at, uh, you know, where it will bring, where it will take me in my career, or if you're looking for a job or prospect in, say, a government college or something like that, then this fellowship really will not add anything to that. Uh, coming to the process of applying, the, it's a very clear, transparent online process on the ICO website where you choose your fellowship, your three months, six months, or a one year option. Complete the eligibility check where it tells you, where it asks simple questions that are you registered with the National Medical Council? Uh, have you completed your residency in ophthalmology? And uh, are you willing to come back to your host country? And those things like that. You upload the documents, and then within a day, they tell you you're eligible. Once you're eligible, they have a list, a directory of ICO hosts, where hosts have expressed their willingness to the ICO and told them that we are willing to accept students for a three-month or a one-year duration fellowship. Uh, so let us know if there are any applications. We'll be happy to accept them. You send your application to them. At one time, you can only send to one applicant. They accept it or they reject it. If they reject it, you can look for another host and apply to them. And then once they accept it, then the ICO says, okay, the host has accepted. Now we'll go through your file and figure out whether, you whether we think you're uh, eligible for receiving our money. And that usually takes two months. And at the end of that process, they tell you that uh, whether your fellowship has come through. The sad part, of course, is that if they, it doesn't come through, you're not eligible to apply for any more attempts. That's the only attempt you get to apply. And the age limit is 40 years for the three-month fellowship. So these are just questions that you know, they, you just, you also don't need to ask yourself, but these are actual questions in the ICO form that you have to fill up. So these are questions that 
you don't necessarily have to be very honest about, but these are questions that you have to give answers that you think the ICO wants to know, wants to hear. So what, what knowledge skills do you wish to acquire? Obviously you don't want to tell them I want to see the nightlife in Europe and things like that. You have to you tell them about what they want to hear, about new techniques, about how you're going to come back and teach that to your residents and things like that. Clear leading questions like, what, will you return and do the same thing? You can't tell, no, I won't. Of course you will. So these are questions that you have to, you can prepare your answers, nice flowery language, get them, give them what they want, and uh, that works around. Uh, beauty pageant questions. Beauty basically. pageant questions. Everybody wants world peace. So there are, of course, sometimes when you want to go to a center, you've met someone at a conference, and they, uh, you ask them, can I do a three-month observership with you? They say, sure, and you want, but their name is not in the ICO fellowship. <coughs> you can still apply to the ICO telling them, I have a name that's outside your directory and I want to apply to them like I did. And they said, sure, you let us know why you want to do that, what is it that you want to learn there and how that specific person is going to help you to gain knowledge and come back and practice and we'll consider your file. So you can do that and uh, then you, you know go on with that. Uh, these are just basic questions of you know what to write, like I said, give them answers that they want to hear, make your CV really nice, whether it's a tiny case presentation in your department that you do, that should go on your CV so that it, you're up in, it appears that you're involved in teaching. Uh, can I apply in multiple places? No, you can, but see really only once at a time. But after one session of applications is done, your file is closed and you can't apply again. So essentially plan well, choose wisely, because an ICO fellowship is, is an asset <coughs> if you personally the ICO exams do nothing, they are just another set of exams which the Indian medical students are very good at giving. Uh, but the unfortunate reality is that unless we clear the ICO exams, uh, the ICO fellowship is not something that we can uh, get. So prepare a timeline because when you apply for an ICO fellowship, it's not like I'm finishing my residency in April, so May, June, July I want to go. When I applied three years ago for uh, in March, I got a slot for June, July, August, the next year. So it's not something that immediately comes through. So plan, have, have a contingency plan in hand. It can be a great experience. You get to learn new things, see new places, make new friends. And like uh, Dr. Minakshi said, you network a lot. Uh, you build your international contacts at conferences. And eventually it helps you, uh, you know, it, help, it will help your practice and will help you, uh, you know, your value and that you bring to meets and conferences. And uh, I think that's all about ICO that I have to say now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Akshay. Any questions to, uh, to Dr. Akshay? This is a good time, because I think he is going to be off to another session elsewhere. So if you have questions about the ICO exam, yeah, shoot off. Recommended. Uh, they say that is why it's advisable. Two. So clear all the. No, not not all three, but. Uh, I got my fellowship after two, so I'm going to say two. And I, uh, they usually just see if you've cleared your clinical sciences. That's an no. absolute sure sure shot that you have to have passed before applying for a fellowship. Uh, let, let me just say that funding is really uh, you know on its downswing in ICO. And so um, the chances of you getting a fellowship without the exams is going to be slimmer in the future. So what Dr. Akshay already um, said. I'm sorry, please, your question. Is it available for people who are more than 40? The three-month three fellowship? Yeah. No, the three-month fellowship so has then, uh, above 40, it's available for what? You can apply for the Frederick Hollows one-year subspecialty fellowship. They're and that's that, available abroad? That is available abroad, but uh, uh, like I said, you'll have to apply and secure the fellowship on your own, and once that has come through, you can then approach the ICO uh, with a request to fund it. Would it be available in the U.S.? Yes. Thank you so much. As, as a teacher, I just wanted to add a point or two about the um, ICO exams. Mm -hmm. We try to insist that our students who can afford to take the exams because we found that their uh, knowledge of the basic sciences and uh, the clinical sciences becomes very solid, ex especially refraction, optics and refraction becomes very solid. So if you can afford it, 
there is plenty of time in the first and second years before the thesis sort of hits you to uh, study and clear the uh, ICO exams. And um, the, the other thing I found is that uh, I, I know people who applied for the ICO fellowships and who were rejected, and many who were successful, like uh, Akshay. Now, the rejection usually was because you were not imaginative about what you wrote for why you want to do a fellowship. It does not uh, go well saying, I am passionate, I want to cure childhood blindness. I mean, the, 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 these are, will not be uh, encouraged. What you really need to be very specific, need to be something novel, and it's something that you will bring back to your institution or country and add value. These are things that they uh, look for in your application. So really do your homework, do a bit of research before you write, uh, you fill your application for the ICO. Just one second, like, like just to, to add on what Dr. Minakshi said, say you're looking at a particular center, look at who's the uh, department chief in that uh, hospital. Go through a literature search and try to see papers that they've published and what is their area of interest and how it is different from what the current practice is. And then if you tweak your answers based on how you want to learn more about imaging in choroidal diseases, which is done at this center, and then bring that to apply that to the problems of the developing world, specific pointed answers really go a long way in helping them. Uh, Dr. Rashman, did you want to add something? I thought I saw your, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, next, we move on to, um, well, if not ICU, are you ready for the longer haul, FRCS? And I invite Dr. Devendra Venkatramani, again, my former uh, student from uh, Essen. And he is, as you can see, FRCS and FICU, and he has done his L fellowship in Vichuretna from LVP and works at the Lakshmi Eye Institute. Um, Devendra. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be part of this uh, instruction course because this is a topic that I'm really passionate about. And the reason I like to talk about the FRCS and, uh, you know, uh, encourage people to do it is not uh, like one of the fables where you, where someone's in a tricky situation and has spent a lot of money or has gone through a really tough exercise and tells everybody, yeah, it's fantastic. You should also do it. You should also do it. It's something that I feel really added value to my uh, training and to my uh, career as well. So I'll just take you first off, we'll start off with a little bit about the Glasgow examination. Now, uh, you may be aware that in the UK there are three colleges in Glasgow, in Edinburgh, That's and in London, mm -hmm. which offer examinations that you can sit and write, uh, even if you've trained in India. But uh, the, out of all of them, the most widely appeared for is the uh, college examination from Glasgow, followed by Edinburgh and followed by uh, London. But I'll be restricting myself over here to, the, uh, to, uh, to talk about uh, the FRCS Glasgow. It's a really, really, really old college. So as you can see, it's almost, uh, it's over 400 years old. And of course, Glasgow is uh, in Scotland, which is still part of the United Kingdom. Uh, we'll finish with some of the, uh, you know, the, the picturesque sites when I had gone there for my convocation. And as you can see, Glasgow is really the heart attack capital of Europe because they deep fry everything. That's a deep fried Mars bar, a Mars chocolate bar that has been deep fried. They eat everything deep fried. Uh, that's me with my good friend, Dr. Asif Virani, and I had the pleasure of taking some uh, special uh, clinical examination training, both of us, from Dr. Rashmin Gandhi, who's sitting here. And uh, some of the images from the convocation itself, as you can see, it's quite a grand affair, which you feel is quite justified after you've spent uh, so much money in appearing and clearing the examinations. <laughs> so um, we, we like to divide everything into parts, and the examination is also divided into parts, which uh, can be confusing because ICO has a different nomenclature and uh, FRCS has a different nomenclature. So part one, A, two, or B, and C, and each of them have subparts as well. But just like in the ICO examination, the part one is basic sciences and optics, and it's an MCQ test. Okay, so the, the good news is, is that if you've done the ICO part one, you're exempt from doing the FRCS Glasgow part one. There's no such cross exemption with Edinburgh. Uh, part two is when you actually come down to clinical sciences, and it also comprises of two parts, so two different sections. Um, one is the MCQ test. If you've done ICO uh, part two, that is the clinical science examination of ICO, then you don't have to write the MCQs, but you still have to write the written paper, which is really a lengthy uh, three-hour qu uh, question uh, paper, or sorry, two-hour question paper, out of which three questions will be in ophthalmology, 
and there's one question in general medicine which generally is a medical emergency and you have to individually pass this question before you pass part two. You may do fantastically in uh, the first three questions and fail the, third, uh, the, the fourth question, but that means you fail that part of the examination. The part three is further divided into structural, structured oral examination and the clinical examination. I'll come uh, into the little bit of detail about this a little later. So for eligibility, I would strongly advise each of you read the website for uh, details about whether you are eligible and when you may become eligible because these are a little confusing and uh, you know it's not very easy at the first glance. But in general, you can give part one at the end of your internship as after, at the end of your internship technically because you just need to be a medical graduate with one year of training in medicine which is your internship. But part two, you have to appear only after you've finished five years of your post MBBS training. And out of those five years, four and a half years should be in ophthalmology. So technically, if you've done six months in ENT or in radiology, you're still eligible to appear for this examination. And part three could be done any time after you've successfully completed parts one and two. So paisa kitna is the big question. And of course, these fees only increase with time. So do pardon me if my, uh, you know, my information is, is a little outdated, but this is, um, you know, roughly what the damages you, you are looking at. And this is going to be cheaper if you write the ICO and get those cross exemptions if you are keen on writing both. So if you're really keen on writing both, I would strongly advise looking at which examination uh, is cheaper as well as the timing because you can write ICO only in April, whereas FRCS is uh, held twice a year. Yes, so uh, we'll skip that. So uh, it's important to remember that you have some limited number of attempts, but I think by si the sixth attempt, everybody would uh, you know, probably have given up a long time ago or be bankrupted a long time before that. So uh, don't worry about the number of attempts for each part. You have plenty of scope to repeat it if you need to. Uh, some of this was covered by Akshay, so I will uh, skip that. Uh, I would strongly recommend reading te the textbook by Elkington, as well as uh, Dr. Uh, Khurana's text textbook is excellent. It's a, it's a lot uh, of detail, which you may not require for this examination, but it's a wonderful uh, textbook on optics and refraction. Uh, similarly, for your basic sciences, there's nothing really different. John Ferris, and if you're very keen on uh, certain topics like genetics and ophthalmology, uh, John Forrester's textbook, who was incidentally the uh, you know, guest of honor and he was conferred an honorary FRCS at, during our convocation. Um, he, uh, his textbook on basic sciences with regard to the eye is really beautiful. Part two is essentially your MS and DNB syllabus. I won't recommend reading anything above and beyond that, but the manual by Jeffrey Lamkin is an MCQ test. So it's good for you to revise what you've already, know, uh, already read. It's very difficult. Most of the answers are not very obvious. So if you fare poorly with this manual, don't worry, you're still likely to pass the examination. Important in part two is the emergency medicine aspect. And this is from their syllabus, what, what are the, the topics that would be expected? So, you know, unconscious patient, management of anaphylaxis, uh, chest pain, breathlessness, acute breathlessness, all of these are very important. And the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine has a wonderful 30 to 40 page um, section right at the end of the book, which details in flow charts with doses, the management of all of these acute medical emergencies, which I would uh, definitely suggest that you mug up because you have to know doses and you have to know uh, the, the proper sequence of management of these patients. So uh, tips for the theory examinations are be practical because even in your theory exam, it's not theory that's being tested. For uh, the essay question that I had, the first question was approach to a 60-year-old woman with watering of the eyes. Now, if you approach it from a theoretical aspect, you will never finish writing that answer. But if you divide your answer into it could be epiphora or it could be hyperlacrimation, the causes in this age group, in this gender could be this, then that's what they're looking for the method in your answer rather than the actual word. This is a very important flow chart that I cannot uh, emphasize less. You have to move from life-threatening conditions to vision-threatening conditions, and the last would be something that's of cosmetic origin. So uh, every, each and every ophthalmic condition, you should bear in mind what could be life-threatening in those. 
part three, as I said, is divided into the viva and the clinical examination. And the viva is basically um, called this very long thing called a structured oral examination. But it's basically a whirlwind of an examination which finishes an, in an hour. And uh, it's done before you know it. There, there are three stations. Each of uh, them is 20 minutes long. Uh, ophthalmic medicine, ophthalmic surgery and pathology, and general medicine and neurology. So the first two stations are, uh, you have uh, two um, examiners. Both of them will be ophthalmologists. In the third station, you have two examiners. One is an ophthalmologist and the other is a physician. So your general medicine part will be tested by a physician and you could have questions on ECG. You could be shown an ECG and say, what is wrong with this ECG? Interpret it and how would you manage this condition? You could be asked something about multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis, naturally systemic problems which could have ocular manifestations as well. In a nutshell, it is a structured examination because the examiners have specific questions written on a card and they have the model answer in front of them. If you don't hit those key points, they won't really be able to ask you the next question. They may then give you a hint or they may offer you an answer. But if you don't r uh, say what is you know, expected, uh, you would probably get stuck over there. And that's why the, the, uh, the exam generally proceeds from simple to more and more difficult questions in the same, sub, uh, in the same question. You often are shown a picture or a, a, a visual field printout or some visual clue uh, on which the question is based. And as I mentioned, it builds on the previous answers. So you move in a very methodical manner when you have to give your answers. The clinical examination is held on a different day, probably a couple of days after your first uh, viva. And uh, it has four heads or four stations, which you can see uh, mentioned over there. Uh, topics that we in India take very seriously, anterior and posterior segments, as you can see, form only 50% of the clinical examination. And 50% are topics that we unfortunately neglect which is neuro-ophthalmology neuro and oculoplasty. And you have individual uh, examinations on these, and you have to pass of all of these individually. So um, you know it's very important that for the FRCS examinations, you have an in-depth knowledge about neuro-ophthalmic conditions, the common ones, and uh, be especially because they could be life-threatening. And that also goes for oculoplastic and lid disorders. The, the examination is basically a 12-minute first station. Uh, uh, once again, there are two examiners per station. And you may be lucky uh, to see three to four patients in, that, in those 12 minutes. If you're de doing well, the examiner will just stop you and say, uh, examine the next patient. Uh, if you're stopped and you know that happens, either you've done brilliantly or you completely botched up. But in most cases, they would give you a hint or a clue, and you would know which of the two it is. Uh, in general, the more patients you see, the better, because once they know you're on the right track and you're able to answer well, they would uh, go on to the next case. What are the advantages of doing the FRCS Glasgow? Now, it's uh, there are certain you know uh, benefits. If you are planning to migrate to the UK, I don't know how easy or difficult this is going to be after the Brexit, but you do not need to give the PLAB to apply for GMC registration, unlike uh, if you have not done the FRCS. So that's one examination you're exempt from. If you do a plan to emigrate to the Middle East or uh, the Far East, that is Hong Kong, Singapore, you probably will get better remuneration than people who do not have the FRCS degree. And it's obviously, it's accepted as a valid degree in ophthalmology in Singapore and Hong Kong. That means you are technically licensed to practice over there. You have obviously cross-examinations as we discussed with the ICOs, uh, ICO parts one and two A. And I think for me, this was the most important reason, the joy of giving exams. We all have this, uh, you know, if, uh, this, this idea. My grandfather, when I decided to get into medicine, said, oh, my grandson will become an FRCS. So you know, the, we all have these ideas that we'll, have, uh, we'll become an FRCS. Uh, it's, it's a great examination to give. The bottom line is that Indian um, training does not prepare you for this examination. It's something that you are not really trained for. And it opens up your eyes to a totally different way of looking at and approaching a patient. Another set of post-nominal uh, initials, obviously, but I would not recommend going down the path of this scholar of medicine, okay? because uh, most of these are just uh, you know, humbug. But yes, it does have that other tangible benefit.
The disadvantage is that it does not allow you to practice anywhere in the sense it's not a licensing examination. You still have to go through those rules and regulations and clear the local um, requirements before you can practice abroad. Obviously, it has no standing in India as such, and it is an expensive examination. I would strongly recommend that anyone who's contemplating giving this examination does give it. It's a wonderful way of opening up your eyes, as I said, to a totally different way of looking at patients. And it definitely changes your approach when you're sitting in the clinic in your independent practice and managing patients. Thank you very much. I'd just like to add that um, we uh, conduct an FRCS training program. Uh, it's, uh, we, we had the first one uh, last year in September, and we plan to make it a six-monthly affair. We unfortunately missed this session, but later in the year, in July and August, we would be having an FRCS training course, which is going to be directed at the clinical examination. We do have hands-on uh, training in, uh, with patients and uh, the actual mock vivas. So I would uh, also suggest that anybody who's interested in giving the examination, you could definitely look us up at uh, lakshmii.org for more details about that course. Thank you, uh, Dr. Devendra. And uh, while, uh, do you, anybody, anybody has questions for Dr. Uh, Devendra? Yes, yes please. The, can somebody hand the mic? Okay, so uh, the question is about post-exam subscription or payments. Uh, at the end of the examination, you are conferred the degree of FRCS. If you want to keep using that degree legally, you need to pay the annual subscription, which is something about uh, something like 10 to 12,000 rupees a year. Um, that annual subscription entitles you to continue using the, the, the initials FRCS, but also entitles you to other member benefits like their library access, uh, conference accesses at uh, discounted rates, and voting rights in the college. So you have to get an FRCS degree at age 30 for another 50 years you are paying subscription, right? Yes, yes you are paying subscription but the advantage of an, being an Indian is that we truly have the best of both worlds. We have cutting edge technology, superb training but we also have this tag of being a developing country. So our subscription is much less than what you would have to pay if you were a British citizen. So that's one advantage for us. One simple question, now the person who has finished a post graduation in ophthalmology and all fellowships and opting for FRCS means how should he look at it like uh, settling in India or abroad? Like suppose he wants to settle in uh, UK or he wants to come back to India. Now uh, what should be his uh, comparison for that? Uh, th there is no advantage of the FRCS if you want to go to the UK except for that tangible benefit of not writing the PLAB. Because you have FRCS means that you would get a job. It doesn't mean anything like that. You still have to uh, get the GMC registration, get the opportunity to uh, you know uh, a job opening, etc. So. It's the, the flip side is that in India, a corporate job or an institutional job is more readily available for someone who has an FRCS because it is thought to be a value addition and it's thought to be a marketing, uh, you know, uh, an advantage for any corporate hospital if you are an FRCS. Uh, yes, lab uh, thing exemption, mm -hmm. only to FRCS Glasgow or even to the? To Edinburgh as well. Any FRCS? FRCS Glasgow and Edinburgh and FRCS, FRC OFT, oh, which is offered by the London uh, College, actually uh, is, uh, you know, you, uh, it's a qu uh, qualifying exam. Uh, uh, we at uh, Shankar Neetralia, uh, we are uh, ex FRCS exam uh, center uh, for FRCS Edinburgh. So perhaps in the next time we hold this course, we can add more information about how to prepare for the FRCS Edinburgh as well, which is also a, a, a wonderful exam a very uh, fair, structured, and an objective exam. And, and other than all the advantages that Dr. Uh, Devendra outlined that, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the tag FRCS and all that, it really comprehensively lets you look at ophthalmology, learn ophthalmology thoroughly and completely. So I think that's a very wonderful feeling of knowing everything inside out. So uh, we'll add a segment next time. I think somebody has a question. Um, yes. How would the FRCS or uh, ICO exams uh, add the values? 
I am not sure about the individual details of those countries, but I do believe for uh, um, Australia and New Zealand, you have to still appear and clear for the Fransco examinations. So that is a different set of examinations. I do not think FRCS Glasgow or Edinburgh adds any added value in qualifying to get a job, basically. Fransco. Get a fellowship, you would get a job, but you would only become registrar everywhere. In fact, even in UK, you can become a registrar or a, a, a step below registrar. SHO, senior house officer. SHO, yeah. sir. But Sorry, as you told in your in your hospital, you are going to plan for the uh, training program for this before this examination. How will be the schedule of it? How will be of the duration? How will be the fees? Yeah. So. Um, Fees has to be decided, but the last training program that we had was a two-day program in which the first day were uh, topics that we felt were very important for the examination. Those would be in the form of interactive sessions. The second day is hands-on with patients and with mock vivas. We had a very good response the last uh, uh, time we conducted it, and um, it, it, uh, we had uh, people who were appearing for the examination after three weeks of this course. It's basically meant for such uh, candidates. And uh, they found that the examination, when they went for, they were much more relaxed and they really could, uh, you know, appreciate the finer nuances because they had already, uh, in a sense, done it before. Uh, we, uh, we incorporate faculty who are already examiners at the, exam uh, at the FRCS examination. So you really get a flavor of the FRCS examination viva. Thank you. Sir. I just wanted to add a point. Like uh, the preparation, you know, people very exhaustive this exam and one advantage like uh, if you apply for these exams in uh, either in Hong Kong or uh, Singapore you have got the advantage like with one uh, exam you can get two degrees we, that's a conjoint exam where you can get an MS or an MD from Hong Kong or Singapore I think that can be kept in mind one preparation you get two degrees okay and for the uh, Edinburgh examination, the other advantage is that after two parts, you get the degree of MRCS Edinburgh, and you get the FRCS after the third part. So you, uh, after two, uh, two examinations itself, you are getting somewhere. Uh, okay. Without much ado, let me talk a little bit about <coughs> fellowships uh, in our country. As opposed to Dr. Shubra, who is going to be talking about a fellowship abroad. So I have no financial interest to declare and I do not endorse any of the fellowships I talk about in my talk, perhaps except Essen. So a lot of people think fellowship is where a fellow gets into a ship and then sails off into the sunset and then lives happily ever after. It's far from the truth. So what could be your reasons to do a fellowship? Anybody here, one or two reasons? Anybody wants to say, why do you want to do a fellowship? Yeah, focus, expertise. Anybody else? Job opportunity is better if you have a fellowship. I, I don't know, but well. Okay, could it be passion? Or maybe it's the fashion. Maybe completion. And I, what I mean by completion is, I had somebody who applied for pediatric ophthalmology. And strabismus. I said, why do you want to do? Madam, in my PG, we never saw even one squint case. I said, oh my God, if you, in your first month, you discover that this thing is horrible. What do you do? You wasted a seat. So that's not the reason to do a fellowship, because you did not have exposure to something during your uh, post-graduation. Action. You see these guys where the nucleus is dropping on this you know, on the optic nerve and somebody is going diving after it and you think it's all going to be very exciting and it's, you know, that's not the reason to do fellowship. It's not just the action. Busyness, business, that's what I meant. So you have dad doing uh, anterior segment cataract, uh, you have mom doing refractive and you, they have found one son-in-law for you, uh, rather your husband for you, who is also doing glaucoma. So what do you do? You have to do vitro retina. Okay, no, that's not the reason. It's not moving forward. When you should not do a fellowship? Confusion. 
when you're not clear. A lot of people have this complex. Oh God, I'm going to finish PG. After PG, what do I do? Something. I have to do something. Okay, I'll do fellowship. And a good reason not to do fellowship is inadequate surgical exposure. If you have done only two cataracts in your PG, okay, please do not go ahead and take long-term vitreoretina. You have no idea what your surgical hands are like. Okay, you will cause more blindness. Or you have an unstable family background. For a while, I used to think if they are going through fights with their husband, you know, the ladies will come to Shankar Netralaya far away from UP to do your fellowship. <laughs> Thinking that will sort out a lot of problems. No, not a good reason. Planning a baby, no, I'm very fair for, you know, people having babies during PG, well, all that is fine. But if you're planning a baby, the hours you have to stand assisting, not a good idea, okay? So maybe wait, have the baby, enjoy the baby, and then, you know, commit to the fellowship. So let's talk about when you're going to plan a fellowship, introspection and preparation. What do you do? First of all, like I said, do not rush. I'm finishing in May. I have to start something in June. No, don't rush. Keep your eyes and ears open during your post-graduation days. Commit to yourself. I have, I have fellows who will come into the pediatric and squint uh, OPD and stand near the door. Because in their mind, they have already, they're already on the macula. So they don't want to do anything to do with the kids, okay? They already think they are vitreoretinal surgeons. No, keep your eyes and ears open during your PG. Pay full attention to every specialty to know what really clicks with you, with your personality. Attend sessions. You are here at the All India Conference. Go to all the uh, specialties that you are considering. Go to the specialties, attend the free papers, attend the lectures, attend instruction courses. See if this thing is really exciting you. Because remember, Usually, once you have taken this fellowship and done a specialty, you're stuck with it the next 40 or 50 years. Okay, it's almost like a marriage. <laughs> and um, the next step is prepare, do some homework. If you're going to go do cornea fellowship and go back to your hometown, maybe there is no eye bank. But you may want to start an eye bank. I mean, that's okay. But suppose you're doing neuro-ophthalmology. You're heavily dependent on neurologists and neurosurgeons to give you referrals. Suppose there, is, there are not enough people around to refer, what happens to your practice? Next, if you, is teaching your passion? Okay, then you go to a fellowship which has got a strong teaching background that will prepare you to be a teacher when you move on with your, uh, with your life. Next, check finances. Okay, if you're going to do solo with your retinal practice, can you imagine the amount of money that you will have to invest for infrastructure, equipment, for paying the staff, Maybe you will be initially the staff, the secretary, the surgeon, the receptionist, the operator, and uh, the uh, OT boy, but or girl. But, but eventually, you will start hiring all of them, and you need money. And maybe you will become very successful, and you will expand. But you need money for that, too. So first, check your finances. Assess your competition and space available. If you're in a small town, and there are already seven refractive surgeons, huh, maybe you want to rethink your fellowship choice. So what to do then? Maybe start doing observer or mini fellowships in the area of interest. These could be official. Many centers offer small mini fellowships uh, officially. They also, you can write to a center and say, can I come and observe for a week? And most of us are fine. Most of us encourage you to come. Because remember, you find out about us, but we also find out about you. You also need to make a list of what you don't want for sure. Very clearly, you decide, I don't like long hours. I like you know, my evening to wrap up by 7 o'clock. I don't like emergencies. And so I will not do this, this, this. Okay? So next comes the question, long term versus short term. Suppose you're going to learn a specific skill. You already have done a cornea fellowship, and you want a specific skill, the Meller corneal surgeries. Or you want to focus only on ROPs. There are little fellowships available which for a month or two. And that, that is adequate. Next question, of course, comes surgical versus non-surgical. Which What I mean by that is, should you do a short-term cataract surgery fellowship? And let me tell you, all of you who apply to fellowships, who have done three, four, five cataracts in your entire PG, you must do a short-term cataract surgery fellowship before taking the next step. The reason for that is, 
a lot of people join charity hospitals, whatever that means. And then I have a feeling that, like I said, maybe you cause more blindness than you actually give vision by practicing. Whereas when you go for a fellowship in SICS or FACO, it's usually a structured, supervised program so that your surgical skills are up very quickly in a matter of a month or two. And then you start deciding about your long-term fellowship. Research fellowships, yes, some centers offer, and they are excellent for building up your CV. If you want to pursue other things like an ICO or if you want to pursue fellowships abroad, nothing like building up your CV with publications. Where to do the fellowship? And what is that? That's a known devil, which means where you did your PG. And uh, that, the comfort, the cushion, you already know. So is that a good idea, to just do the fellowship where you already did your PG? I have two examples here who did not. And I would say get out of your comfort zone, because you will learn a different uh, approach. You will learn, uh, because if you really are astute PG, a really good PG, you would have learned a lot of things about your area of interest even when you were a PG. So going to a, a different center offers you a completely new insight, gives you a different set of faculty, different approach to everything, um, and I think it's a wonderful idea. Do your homework. Speak to other fellows. Look at publications from the institute. During observership, if you're going to go to those mini observerships, look at the mood of the fellows. Are they looking miserable? Do they look like they're in prison? You don't want that either, but at the same time, you don't want them all planning party all week long, which means nothing serious is happening. And cultural adjustments may be a big thing. I mean, I, I, have, I have students who come from the north and who, who start their fellowship. First week, they're excited because they're eating dosa and vada every day. After a week, they hate it, and they say, what is the yellow rice, white rice, green rice, blue rice? Ma'am, what is this? Rice, rice, rice. And then they go into depression. So cultural adjustments may be a big thing. What do you look for in a fellowship? Cutting, cutting, cutting? Is it what you're interested in? No. You also need good clinical load of patients. You need the freedom. You, in other words, you need to have some independent time, independent OPDs. You need to have good set of faculty with a wide range of uh, skill, sets, skill sets. For example, in the pediatric ophthalmology program, we have somebody who is an expert in, C in cortical vision impairment. We have someone who is very good at adult strabismus. We have someone who is good at uh, congenital cataracts, pediatric cataracts. So there's a wide range of things that are available in one program. So that, that's what you are looking for, a good wide range of exposure from the faculty. How liberal is your program sending you to meetings, CMEs? You know, how much exposure do they give you? Is your program, is the fellowship program structured? Very important. Do they have a curriculum, logbooks, assessment? I know it sounds like school, but no, it's very important to have a structure, which means the faculty, the program, has committed that they will teach you all this, this, this while you are doing the fellowship. Will they help you with career counseling? Do they give you research projects? All these add value to the fellowship. So what is out there in our motherland? There are government hospital senior residencies like Jipmer, Ames, and RP Center. There, were, there are many private hospital fellowships. I've just randomly listed them out. They're all uh, on the net. So we have uh, short-term and long-term offered by all these hospitals in the south zone, north zone, east zone, west and central. And um, I even found this. There is something called... Uh, eye surgery training, uh, which says, which brings people from abroad. They have partnerships with uh, hospitals in India, and they come here and they ensure that you do um, X number of surgeries. Now, you know, when these things are happening and our patients are being taken away by the foreigners, that is do fellowships in our motherland. And you as fellows, when you apply and give feedback, go through your fellowships, at the end of, you, end of it, give feedback, it helps make our fellowships better and better. When you apply, there's a couple of words about writing a CV. Please do not uh, start your CV by my father is so and so and my he is here. No, that's not how you write your CV. So make sure your CV is um, honest, is structured. Make sure your CV uh, reflects on all your achievements so far, mostly academic. Uh, I have some, I had somebody recently apply uh, for an oculoplasty fellowship, and his CV started off by saying, I was always amongst the top three from kindergarten to class 12. Okay. okay. 
make sure your referral letters are honest. So, and they are from people who know you professionally. For example, when you, when in the interview, I asked them, how do you know Dr. Uh, Mohan? Uh, Dr. Mohan uh, is my, like my uncle. I know him from when I was a little girl. No, that's not acceptable. So preparing for the D-Day. So read up your subject. So you read up what you're applying for thoroughly. If you come and sit there for a pediatric ophthalmology uh, you know, uh, fellowship interview and I ask you, what is the gold standard test for squint? And then uh, you're heaving, okay? Then I know you're really not interested. You've not even done your homework. Next, look up. What I mean by look up is, not look up at the, the uh, interviewer, look up what the program is famous for. What are the recent uh, uh, trials they have done? What are the publications that have come out of the institute? So it's, you already show a sense of belonging if you do that preparation. Dress up. I will next time promise to show you photographs of how all applicants show up in the interviews. So go there well-dressed, well-groomed, and show up on time. And open your mouth and speak up when they ask you questions in the fellowship. So with that, I want to tell you the other programs coming up in Shankar Netralia. We have the Cataract Catalyst in April 29th and 30th, the Retina Summit, 14th, 15th July. Mark your calendars. And the Shankar Netralia Glaucoma Meet, which is in September 2nd and 3rd. Thank you for your attention. Any questions for me? To me. Okay, we've come to the final segment of the uh, today's instruction course, and again, a very exciting topic: fellowship abroad. Dr. Shubha Goel, Director, I Aesthetic Clinic, Ophthalmic Plasty and Facial Aesthetics, the Apollo Hospitals. In Hyderabad. I'm very happy for Dr. Shabrago to um, agree to speak on this topic. She'll give you her unique perspective. Thank you, Dr. Minakshi, and uh, what a warm welcome from all of you for the first day first show. Um, so you have heard about the exams. You have heard about how to apply for foreign fellowships. Now let me talk about when you don't have exams and you still want to go abroad, why, how, and what you should be doing, right? How many of you are uh, interested to go overseas for an extended fellowship program? Not you. Okay. So let me start with one of my favorite slides. Are you wanting to do a fellowship abroad or overseas because you just want to make your visiting card more fancier? Do you want to add a little more degrees over there? Is that what you're looking for? Absolutely not. Okay. Because when you're looking for any kind of training program, you have to ask the following questions to yourself, which I'm sure have been you know, summarized since morning. Is it something, as I said, for glamour or just because you just wanted to do or someone has asked you to do? Is it something which makes you proud when you feel in the crowd saying that I'm a foreign returned fellow? Or is it because everybody is doing you want to have a degree against your name saying I'm so-and-so trained from so-and-so institute? or you were really missing out something during your training program or as a person is why you want to go overseas to get trained. So if I talk about my journey from the postgraduate student to a fellow in best of the institutes of Shankar Netrali and then going abroad, the answer which I could give myself was I was missing out on something. And what was that something? I was looking out for a place which could give me a more structured and a better overview or open my mind to a better patient care and systems and processes. It's not that where I was trained was not good enough for me to jump into practices. I wanted something more. I was missing out something as an individual when it comes to the subject understanding. So the question is, when do you actually do your foreign fellowship or a fellowship abroad? Do you want to do immediately after your fellowship or a primary fellowship which you have finished in India? Or would you like to do some time as a consultant, have some clinical experience and go abroad? 
obviously you have to choose best of the places in your subject when you're looking out for institutes or the mentors abroad and then you have to think of the finances unfortunately unless you have the finances to feed yourself you cannot go abroad for a year or two years and you know learn something and come back so if you look at my journey how i planned it out is that i basically went out for the extended fellowship program after a year and a half of my consultant at Shankaranya the reason being after you have done your initial fellowship you need to have hands on with the patients and surgical hands on to understand where exactly you stand and what exactly you want to refine and revisit if you are going abroad because if you learn dcrs here and you want to learn a better dcr abroad it doesn't make any sense right so you need to add on to what you have already learned and for that an initial experience clinical experience is must i chose for a long term fellowship because personally i feel in my subject which is oculoplasty and facial aesthetic short term doesn't make sense because if i have to see the patients i have to follow them i have to learn the nuances of each and every procedure i need to be there for a year year and a half i went on a scholarship fortunate enough to get a rotary ambassadorial fellowship but you can have self funded avenues as well and i'm going to talk about the scholarships and obviously i chose the best place which was in my uh, you know uh, subject which i could afford to go uh, abroad so look at the grants and scholarship now this is a million dollar question when we applied in 2008 and 9 they were not much available on the google search or internet to guide us we were relying more on the guidance from our seniors and mentors but now you have avenues you can be funded by the hospital or the workplace where you are because it has become a more open minded affair as if now that you are going abroad and learning you can actually contact the universities where you are going and sometimes they do help with the aid uh, a part of the aid if not the full aid rotary or lions institutes do have scholarship programs but they have some specifics they have some do's and don'ts which you need to pass through to apply for them or to actually uh, have them in your kitty there are certain ngos obviously we have heard about ico fellowships and then there is a load of information on the google where different organizations whether it's corporate or non corporate who are coming forward to help you out with universities in fact now there are a list of universities the top 10 universities in for example retina and you can choose your place go through the details contact the individuals and then arrange for your funds and the scholarship programs so here i was uw my dream place where i landed on july of uh, january 9 2009 when it was the coldest day of the year or maybe in 15 years and my dream team these are the uh, some of the best mentors i could be with in united states and what did we do there just a reminder i mean a lot of people think that when you go abroad you're going to get a lot of hands on or some people even come back and claim that i did so and so surgeries most of the fellowship programs abroad are going to be observership unless you are with a private player and they can have some licenses to allow you to scrub in with them but the programs are so structured that if you are a keen observer believe me you can operate any difficult case or deal with any difficult clinical scenario when you come back so you need to be a keen observer and you have to be a keen teacher as well what you observe you impart and you learn more read publish and present your working hours are not 7 to 8 hours a day but 12 hours a day when you go abroad because you have a short time in hand where you want to extract the maximum from the best of the people who have been given to you so the key term is only work hard and harder that's the key you cannot go and have a sight seeing in uw madison you can enjoy certain hours but then you have to get up early sleep late and do your homework well also if some institutes are sponsoring you for example i was with rotary you have a responsibility to fulfill the role which they have asked you for which in my case was to give talks and to create awareness about the country and get appreciated for it then comes a million dollar question will you be appreciated or taken to the same pedestal as the local fellows or their own fellows are yes you can you have to earn it in uw we had something called the white coat dinner or a farewell and i was happy that i could earn it not everybody does but if you do hard work you can earn it so it's not that you're coming from india you should not feel inferior about your training at the home ground 
you have to go there, prove yourself better and earn your thing. So in short, what I would like to summarize is, you change your mindset when you go for further fellowship programs or training programs. You gain certain confidence at an individual level, at an academic level. You have better understanding concepts of the same subject which you have been reading throughout for last two years here. You learn new systems and processes which you can incorporate in any kind of practice patterns you follow. You have mentors and friends for life to guide you three. You have a clarity of your mission in life in your career which you want to do. And the far most important thing, you learn a better patient care. Believe me, it does change with the you know, trainings or any kind of trainings which you take up. So in the last five or six years post my fellowship program, how it has changed me was my topic. So I would just summarize. I did publish. I did have chapters, atlases, books, so on and so forth. You gain the confidence of organizing international state of art conferences. You become a faculty and I get an honor to stand here and speak and you know, talk in front of you. I could be an instrument in opening the first aesthetic clinic in India in Shankanetrala, which I'm very proud of. You could train both at an institute level or corporate levels. You become an avid teacher and you, know, you, you, can, you can impart the knowledge, you can give the knowledge to the next generation. You learn to handle the difficult cases and surgeries at your own ease. Obviously then you get awarded and recognized. ETC, 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 I can just stand here and boast myself about my achievements, but the most important thing is that you become a better student and a better leader, and that's what you're looking for in your career span, in whatever you do. So it's not about being the best, it is about being better than what you were yesterday. So you have to look at or introspect about yourself what you want to do. So I would just like to end with this. This is self-explanatory that there would be obstacles, there would be hardships, but with the hard work, there are no limits. And you can achieve to be with the best in the world. And you can come back and impart the similar knowledge to the next generation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, um, uh, because the t uh, we've uh, almost exceeded the time. No, we're right on time. So I thank all the speakers for a lot of uh, insight. And I thank uh, an audience for enthusiastic participation. When you see us around in the meeting, uh, please feel free to stop us. I say this on behalf of my uh, speakers. Please feel free to stop us and ask us any questions that may have come up in your mind. Thank you so much. <laughs>